be asleep like the rest. Yeah. Yeah, like the world, the, the return of the Lord's going to catch the world as, as a whole by surprise. But then Paul says, don't you be asleep like the rest, you know. It's so easy for a sleepiness to kind of seep into the church. And that's why all this focus on evangelization, I don't think is going to go anywhere unless people get, get convicted right. about the urgency of it, the truthfulness of it, the necessity of it, that our default situation isn't saved but lost. Yeah. Without it, you, you don't get the stakes, how high the stakes are, and you don't understand the world we're living in. And that is that this is a battleground. And we should be battling for our own souls every day. Like yeah. taking seriously, it, the contrast, I was reading some of the lives of the saints recently. I know you had visited Fatima not long ago and talked about the amazing way in which the, 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 the children who are now canonized, I guess two of them are canonized, yeah, is that right? Yeah, two of them. Yeah, how they, they vigil, vigilantly fought for souls, yeah. their own soul, but also for the salvation of others. Because yeah. they, by God's grace and revelation, which is really in the word of God, it's yeah. there in the teaching of the church, they grasped yeah. the truth about what was at stake. Yeah. And they ordered their whole lives in a way that cooperated with Jesus' saving work in the earth. So they, they were able to value what was most valuable because their heads were clear, their minds were clear. Yeah, yeah, and the way their minds got clear is that Mary opened up an insight into hell and they actually saw hell for a split second and it, and it determined the whole rest of their life saying, yes, this is real. And Mary said, so many souls are going to hell but so few people are praying for them and offering sacrifice. And the whole, the whole meaning of Fatima is basically evangelizing people to repentance right. and conversion. You know, Mary is a great evangelist and the children of Fatima, they spent their life, their short life that two of them had telling people about the message, you know, we need to repent, we need to stop offending God, we need to start praying for the salvation of souls, we need to offer sacrifice, you know, for reparation for sin, and mankind is so offending God, we, you know, like, you know, they just, it just yeah. got emblazoned into their minds and hearts, and and that's why, you know, through the thing we're doing at Renewal Ministries, Peter, the preaching and teaching we do, and all the different ways we do it, we're praying for the grace of the Holy Spirit. We're praying for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to, to engrave these supernaturally revealed truths on people's minds and hearts so they can live with the same fervor and the same clarity of purpose of life like those little children of Fatima. Yeah, lived. Lord, free our minds so we can see the truth and live in the truth and direct our wills toward that yeah. action, toward that end. You yeah. know, I, I was thinking as you were preaching about um, the Romans passage says, you know, we, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of God. Mm -hmm. And Paul says twice in those last two verses, we will personally give an account. Every person will give an account for himself or herself before the living God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that one of the most destructive aspects of this universalism and the kind of presumption that's got people gripped. It's like, yeah, it'd be no big deal. He'll probably give me a high five and I'm in and let's go. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Instead of saying, no, you literally will stand before the holy God and give an account for what you did with the freedom and the time that you gave him and how you responded to the, his gift of his beloved son yeah. and the revelation and then Mary's coming and the prophets and the preachers and yeah. all the message that yeah. came, did you ever receive it? Yeah. Did you ever respond to it? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's a big deal. It's, it's yeah. the biggest deal. Really. Yeah, yeah. So it's like that, that parable that Jesus tells about the rich man and the poor man and and the rich man ends up in hell and the poor man ends up in heaven. The rich man says, wow, I, we got to tell my brothers about this. You know, could, could you send somebody, you know? And, and, and the answer, of course, is that, well, they have Moses and the prophet. They already have the revelation. They've already been warned. And then, and then the person says, you know, even if somebody should return from the dead, they wouldn't believe him. So people can close their hearts to the truth that's already there, that's already right in front of them. They could have made decisions to reject the revelation that God is giving of himself in the creation, the re revelation that God is giving of himself in their conscience, their sense of right and wrong. They can yeah. bury that, and then it plunges them into a deeper darkness, and they can end up in a very, very bad place where they've said no to God. Yeah. And without even intending to, to say, I'm, I'm consciously rejecting God, I'm consciously rejecting God's plan, that may not be happening in people, but right. what is happening, yeah. not taking serious the revelation of God, not uh, fighting the battle each day like we're called to do, mm -hmm. and not putting first things first. You know, life passage, seek first the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And God slips into a secondary or a tertiary position in a person's life, and they feel like, well, he's in the orbit, he's in my orbit, you know, he's there. 
But what ends up happening, if you don't put first things first, you don't put him where he needs to be as Lord, all of a sudden you start making decisions that are presumptuous. You make decisions you're easy on yourself than you should be. Yeah. Your, your view of the world and what this life's supposed to be starts to get dulled. Yeah. Then the world starts teaching you and it starts going after you to say, wait a minute, you should have more of this. You should have more of that. Yeah. You know, and more empty yeah, look promises. Look what other people are doing. Look what other people yeah. have, you know. And all the empty yeah. promises start yeah. coming your way of what you should be, what should be yours by right here now yeah. and get it while you're here on earth before you know it. You're way down the path. Yeah. You're way down that wider road that, that's why this gospel, you preach this all the time, that many choose to travel it. I don't think people choose at the turning point to say, hmm, I don't want God, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. Some might, yeah. some probably do. Yeah. But the majority just slip into not paying attention to God yeah. anymore, yeah. not paying attention to yeah. God's word anymore. Yeah. And it all gets dulled, and before you know it, there's this powerful river that you're just riding down, and before you know it, your life will end. Yeah. And guess what? You actually made a decision against God with yeah. how you live, yeah. even though yeah. you say, wait a minute, I don't remember making that decision. Well, how did you use the freedom I gave you? And did yeah. you take the word I gave yeah. you? Know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Paul says, don't let your freedom be an excuse for the flesh. It's so easy for us to be led by our flesh, by led by comfort or approval of others yeah. or wanting to be accepted or not wanting to rock the boat or not wanting to stand out. and. Jesus says, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'm not going to acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. You, you got you to pay a price. You got to make some yeah. choices. You got to decide some things. You got to break with the culture. Yeah, right. there's no way around it. Paul, you know, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, people said, what should we do? And he said, you know, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, repent. And he says, save yourself from this wicked generation. Yeah. You know, you really got to break with the wicked culture that we're living in. It's always been a wicked culture in one way or another, in one yeah. degree or it's another. It's fallen. It's a fallen reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. But right now, it really is a wicked culture. It's a wicked culture dominating universities, dominating entertainment industry, dominating, you know, thought leaders, dominating technology. It's wicked. It's a wicked culture that's forcing people and threatening people and moving them in a direction that's really away from Christ. And the words of Peter are relevant again. Save yourself from this wicked generation. You know, and regularly, Ralph, we hear people who are trying to hold on to the gospel or traditional teaching on marriage, family, whatever, saying being accused of being haters and being really bad people. And what's actually happening, it's kind of lights have been going on for me more and more, is what's hated in the earth right now in so many places is God's revelation about reality. Yeah. About God's revelation of what's a human being, what's a marriage, what's a family, what's human destiny, what are you here for, what's your identity, yeah. all that, that is what's being rejected yeah. so aggressively. And yeah. it's it's that deep spiritual battle yeah. that's at the root of it all. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. You know, it's good to be talking about these things. It's good about sharing them. It's good about yeah. all the ways in which we're able to communicate this to people because these are words of life. These are words of salvation. This is all about being saved or being lost. Yeah. yeah. You know, just like Peter was saying, we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we need to know what's going to happen. I wrote a booklet called What Happens When I Die, and we'd like to make it available to you so you can be ready for when you die, so you can be ready to face the judgment seat and to know really what, how we should be living our life now, but also exactly what Scripture tells us about what happens after we die. So we'd like to give it to you just as a gift for free. You can call the 800 number that's on the screen right now, or even more simply, you can just go to our website, renewalministries.net. Right on the home page, you'll have an opportunity to click on the free booklet, and we'll send it right off to you. And I think you'll find it really helpful for your own prayer, your own meditation. I think you'll also find it helpful, something that you can give to friends and relatives and neighbors and parishioners to help them wake up to the fact that we are all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We all are going to have to give it an account of our life, and we need to know what happens when I die. We all die, but not all deaths are the same. To die in unrepented sin is a bitter death that will only lead to the indescribable agony of eternal separation from God. But to die as a Christian, our sins forgiven, is to die a very different kind of death, a death which has now been transformed into a doorway to paradise. I've written a booklet called What Happens When I Die to help you and I end up in paradise rather than in hell. Go to our website, renewalministries.net, and simply click on the booklet or call the number on the screen and we'll send it right out to you just for the asking for free. What a gift we've been given. We can die in the love of Christ and be with Him forever.